Good to go. Thank you, sir. All right. I'm Jared. I'm going to be talking hacking identity today. A uh, little bit of context. Uh, I am very grateful for the opportunities I've had in my career. Uh, I went to school to be a music teacher. So, uh, I mean, at the time that I was in school, it was a few years ago, there was no information security, cybersecurity, anything. Um, so everything I had to learn, I had to learn ground up, hardware job, uh, tech support on the, uh, the phones, loved that job. Um, spent some time public utilities, some time retail, jumped over into consulting for a bit, got tired of that, uh, took a job uh, in higher ed. Um, the consulting people came back and said, we'll pay you a lot more. So I said, okay, I'm not tired. Um, and, uh, I'm over on the, the vendor side now. So aside from like, uh, like a CISO position, which I'm not really interested in, not my, uh, not my bag. I've had my hands in everything. And in putting this talk together, um, I took my retail experience, which was deploying an identity and access management solution and managing it for two years. And when I say managing, I was one of the two people who was on call 24 seven. It was me and one other guy, and we just traded up for two years. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of identities. So we had corporate, we had distribution, and then we had um, all the retail stores. Uh, so I know what it's like to live as a blue teamer who's got to manage and defend this environment. Uh, in my pen testing days, especially consulting, uh, I was one of the people who took advantage of that knowledge to try to break shit and sneak around all the controls that people put in place. Um, now that I'm at a company uh, that focuses on identity and access management, I can go talk to other people who have been building some of these technologies. And I put all that information together and said, look, I'm going to just share everything. Um, I am very much, even though I'm a, I'm a security professional, I, I am still by vocation a teacher. I love teaching. And what you'll see in the, the slide deck today is way too much information to write down. Um, I have a profile on SlideShare. And I have a profile on Speaker Deck, which is like GitHub's version of SlideShare. This deck is out on both. So you can download it after. And I've got links at the end. The approach that I have always taken from a security standpoint is that we have to know both sides. If you want to be a good pen tester, talk to the blue team. Talk to the people who are taking the phone calls and deploying and managing the technology. If you want to be good and have a stable environment that does what it's designed to do, Talk to the pen testers because a pen tester is going to show you how an attacker thinks. Bill's talk on uh, getting in front of devs and showing devs OWASP. Uh, he and I um, have been preaching that same message for so long that if you get the developers out and in front of a, a, an attacker, a pen tester, and say, this is how attackers think. This is what they're going to do. The reaction the devs are going to get you is, why in the hell would anybody do that? Because they don't think that way, right? They're, they're builders and, and not breakers. So by putting those two things together, you get a more effective uh, solution, effective environment. You can get back to just doing what you were hired to do. In uh, December, F5 published this report. Uh, what's it, something like a decade of data breaches? Oh, lessons learned from a decade of data breaches. Uh, and similar to the Verizon approach of looking at actual incidents that were um, eventually escalated to the point of a, a publicly disclosed data breach. They found that the vast majority of those attacks were taking advantage of one of two weaknesses, almost without fail. Uh, attackers are going to go after application security weaknesses, and they're going to go after credentials. Um, I've got a link to the report at the end. It's it's pretty uh, pretty eye opening. But the, the the important takeaway for us as security professionals is with everything that we could be working on. If we don't get identity right and we don't get application security right, we're going to get popped. And that's that's what we see if you go out to the chronology of data breaches. Um, it's not the super sexy stuff. It's the basic shit that keeps happening. Um, the attack surface that we're responsible to, for defending, is it, it's a necessary evil. This is the way the Internet works, right? I can't have computers at my company talking to computers at another company unless they understand... TCP IP, unless they understand all of the network protocols that make that happen, unless we understand 
how Jared at company A is J123 at company B. And they're really the same person, even though that, that moniker is, is different. Um, now that uh, <laughs> um, social media has become kind of the, uh, the powerhouse, good or bad, for what it is, um, there's a lot of information out in the public space that was never out in the public space before. This is really good for attackers, really bad for people who are trying to defend organizations. Does anybody do OSINT gathering, open source intelligence gathering? This is hands down to me the most entertaining thing you can do in your day. When I do a penetration test, if I've got five days on a test, I carve out the first three for intelligence gathering. I want to develop a deep, thorough understanding of who I'm going after before I run my first vulnerability scan, if I even need to run a vuln scan. You'll be amazed how much information you can find that's exploitable without actually scanning uh, people directly. Um, and then we've also got an increasing reliance on software as a service. If you want to know what software as a service uh, solutions your, your people are using, Get out from behind your desk. Yeah, I, I did this at OSU. You, you have to go out and talk to people. I would ask people over and over, what websites do you log into to do your job? You will be amazed at how effective that question is because it's simple. I don't ask them, do you have any software as a service deployed? Because they heard software and they shut down. But if I say, what websites do you log into to do your job? They're like, oh, well, I go here. Just let me open up my bookmarks folder. And then you can see all the software as a service solutions that live outside of your organization's identity and access management controls. Software as a service solutions that don't have strong passwords, that don't have expiring uh, creds or, or accounts or credentials. And so attackers have learned that, um, to, to Bill's point about the OWASP uh, top 10, how logging is now a big deal, that we've got this complexity that's hard enough for us to understand what normal looks like. And if we don't understand what normal looks like, Somebody who gets in with a valid set of creds can camp out on our network. They can keep logging into our external VPN services and poke around for months. Because if they come in today and pop the database that's got all the customer data, the PII, they're going to get this many records. But every week they stay on your network, they're going to get more and more data. So this notion of persistence, this notion of attackers camping out on your network and just stealing data gradually over time, is more commonplace, which makes it even worse when we discover the breach. Um, when it comes to pen testing, I am not super sexy awesome, uh, and I don't pretend to be. I can hold my own on a pen test. Uh, I have had the, the good fortune to work with some people who amaze me. Uh, and what I learned, especially from some of the pen tests I worked on in my last consulting job, is that penetration testing today uh, is... If you've got a, a mature pen tester, there, there's a certain component of that that's a repeatable process. And I have a guy uh, who I can't mention because who he works for and, and what he does. And he gets real embarrassed when I talk about him. But um, I have seen him go from unauthorized outsider. So not on the internal network, uh, no tech, no creds, no anything, to domain admin by lunchtime on day one. And when you've got a two-week engagement and a client's paying you a lot of money to hammer away at two weeks, you don't go to them that afternoon or the first day and say, I'm done. What else do you want me to do? Uh, so you spend time pillaging. You spend time poking around and seeing where you can provide value. But um, the fact that we have repeatable processes that are built on things that we have known about for years, the password spraying stuff that Black Hills was talking about a couple of years back is amazing, like how quickly and how simply it is to get in while eluding the uh the detective controls, right? The alerts and the security information event management systems uh, that attackers are using. But it's not all doom and gloom. If you take time to understand the blue team, the IAM offside, and then combine that with your your uh, red team attack and pen, um, it's it's really simple to get ahead of some of these things. So let me just burn through a few mm -hmm. IAM terms uh, in case uh, they're not familiar to you. These are the terms that I recommend you start to get your, your head around. Um, IAM, IDM, uh, IAM, people refer to it differently. Federated versus everything living in-house means that we're expanding this trust outside. Um, LDAP, uh, I had something, I was talking to somebody recently, uh, and they were talking about their directory, like their active directory, 
but I'm so used to using LDAP for a combination. Like when I go into AD, I have a username and password, right? And if an application developer is authenticating against Active Directory, then they have the option of whether or not to also do authorization against Active Directory. So I'm, I'm Jared. I need to prove I'm Jared. I offer up my password. They let me into the app. What am I allowed to do when I'm logged into the app? Well, if they write their code to go back to Active Directory and say, what groups is Jared a part of or what attributes does he have on his, his directory object? Um, then they'll feed that back to the application. And when Jared, the user, tries to change somebody else's password, it'll say, you, you're not allowed to do that. You don't have that entitlement. You don't have that, that permission. Um, but it's optional for developers to do that. They could say, look, I'm just going to call out to LDAP for username password. I'm just going to call out to AD or whatever your LDAP store is. And then I'm going to write all the logic in my app to control what you can do once you log in and, and uh, who you can, um, like what you can change and what you can modify. Not that any one way is better than the other, but understanding that I might be competing against a developer who may or may not be security minded. Oh, now you guys can see how super sexy I am. Um, <laughs> I could be competing against a developer or I can be competing against uh, maybe a, a sysadmin or like a Windows uh, domain admin who's provided some guidance on how to do that. Helps you understand how to, uh, how to better attack an organization. Single sign-on is super sexy for attackers because if I pop you once, I get everything, right? It's the all your eggs in one basket. I, if I get your creds and get logged into this system, then I can go anywhere I want, but properly implemented, uh, that doesn't have to be the case. And then uh, federation, we talk about, you know, I'm, I'm Jared at the company I work for, but um, I use travel, right? A lot of companies use Concur uh, for, for travel. So instead of setting up a whole different Jared over there that I have a different username and password, uh, I might log in internally and then they'll create a token and say, look, Concur, when Jared comes over here, we've already proven that he's Jared. Don't bug him again. Just let him go in and do his thing. Um, the, uh, the other four um, kind of processes, and I'll come to these in just a minute. Entitlements are things that uh, thing that somebody has. So I can have a laptop. That's an entitlement. I can have a phone. That's an entitlement. I could have domain administrative rights. That's an entitlement. So that stack of entitlements is what you're going after when you get creds. That's why we want domain admin when we get in, because they have uh, more additional entitlements that are more uh, more sensitive. Um, attributes, like in Active Directory, that might be Jared is DA. Yes or no, right? That's how you understand whether or not I have the entitlement. And then provisioning and deprovisioning are a big deal. Provisioning is is giving people a thing, right? I'm a new hire. I start Monday. My boss wants me to start working when I get to my desk. So telling him that I have to wait three days until you give me all the access and stuff I need is frustrating. Uh, so what do organizations do, right? I'm a manager. I'm hiring somebody. Well, what permission should he have? Just give him all the permissions I have, right? Or give him this other guy on the team who's been here for 20 years who has more permissions than he should have. Uh, and then you create this access sprawl that gives attackers the ability to do a lot. Deprovisioning is something we know we should be doing and we still struggle with it. Hey, my last day is Friday. Take all my access away. Good luck, right? What software as a service applications do I have credentials in? Who's even watching for that? How will they even know that they need to go in and turn off my account? So every organization follows some kind of life cycle where they give somebody things and they set up auth authentication authorization. And then we get to a point, and I love, love this piece, where we say this is too costly, too expensive. It's creating too much of a burden on IT. Just put self-service out there and let users do all the things themselves. But every self-service interface you, you publish to the internet is open to people who don't work for your company. So I may not work for your company, but if I can find your password reset portal, you damn well better believe I'm going to try to reset somebody's password. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we have people coming back and, and checking and, and deprovisioning. Um, this company recall, I like um, they have a really good white paper on identity and access management and Ernst & Young. Um, but understanding not only what the processes are, but who the people are will make you a better pen tester. How many people have ever had a help desk position? Right? Was this your entry into IT or into the company? That's how we do it. I, so I worked for a very large retailer uh, in Columbus. And during the... Uh, uh, economic downturn of what, 08? Um, <laughs> we, we had to let some people go at the company. 
right? Everybody was doing that. Everybody was cutting back on number of employees. And this company lives and dies by brand. And they, honest to God, had people who were hired to work at this company whose job it was sit at the front desk, look pretty, play football, uh, soccer, frisbee out front. And when you see a visitor coming in, just smile, wave, say, hey, dude, how you doing? And make everybody feel good. That that was everything to this company, brand. So as you can imagine, positions like this are not business critical. When it comes time to cut back on staff, somebody took a look at the number of people who were in that position and said, we should let some of these people go. But then leadership said, no, I don't want to let them go. These people will be with the company forever. These people live and die by our values. There's got to be something else we can do with them. And somebody else chimes up and says, well, there's some open positions on the help desk in IT. Just put them over there. Um, I like that because I hate seeing people get screwed over by a big company. And I hate uh, when friends get shown the door. That's an awful thing for everybody. But when I'm a security manager and I have somebody who doesn't even know how to turn a computer on, re responsible for resetting people's passwords and resisting social engineering attacks, I've now identified my biggest risk, right? Understanding that people in the help desk are going to have responsibility around password resets, around granting and removing access, opens up a whole other avenue of attack for you. Social engineering, right? Not technical. And you're going to be more successful with them than you will the senior analysts and the architects and the old graybeards who've been doing this for long enough that we don't trust anybody. But in the middle, you've got the more technical group. Anybody who work in a SOC, right? It, my... <laughs> My sympathies, right? Because if you want somebody to quit a company, make them stare at logs all day, right? It's it's boring to no end unless you give them something challenging and exciting and let them do something that they're capable of doing. But understanding that an organization may or may not have a sock or they may have one person whose job it is to watch all the alerts is going to tip you off as an attacker to know whether or not you can do some of your automated scans, I might be able to get away with an NMAP scan, but as soon as I fire up Nessus, that's, that's going to trip something, right? Somebody's going to see me. Well, you'd be surprised. At a large enterprise with a security operations center, yes, you, uh, you will tip your hand and you will get blacklisted. But if you're going after a small mom and pop, you can scan them all day and they'll have no idea because they don't have that capability in-house. So know who does what in an organization as you build out your attacks. So as I mentioned, uh, start with open source intelligence gathering. Um, I do a lot of teaching outside of my day job. I did a class for Pluralsight a couple of years ago. I don't know if you know Pluralsight. They do training for web app developers. Um, they started doing some security training, and a buddy of mine who did one of their security classes said, you ought to talk to him. I did a five-hour class on open source intelligence gathering, and that's all I talk about is, and it's not even employees, it's just what do you look for when you're targeting a company? And this is some of the stuff I put in that class. Take time to understand a company's uh, technical footprint, their technology stack. Between Shodan and Census, you're going to find a ridiculous amount of information without ever touching an organization's uh, network. Shodan, uh, which was John Matherly, I love the work he's, he's done with this. Um, it's got information about IPs that were open to the internet at one point and the, uh, the ports that they were listening on so you know what services you can interact with. You know whether or not an IP might have a web service like an HTTP or HTTPS that's not meant to be published externally or that maybe they, they shouldn't. Um, census is all, uh, um, I, or what I want to say, HTTP, HTTPS, web server stuff. Um, but between the two, it's a really good complement to know where the login pages are. <coughs> Find subdomains. I feel like it's not been around for very long. I've only recently started using it. Love it. If you want to know all of the subdomains an organization has published online, you just run a query on the domain uh, out on find subdomains and they pull back everything they've already gathered. Um, Hurricane Electric's BGP toolkit will give you some of the information, although because they limit their search results, sometimes it's tough to find what you're looking for. And what's an SPF record? You know what it is? I heard it over here. Sender policy framework, what are SPF records tied to? What servers? Email servers. Why do I care about the sender policy framework and the email servers? Because it tells you who's allowed to send mail on behalf of this domain. These are my software as a service applications. I found things that aren't going to show up necessarily in Shodan or Census because I know there's a trust relationship between this company 
and the people they're sending email to and from or the people they're allowing to send email to and from. Those five resources are going to give you a ton of information about the tech. What about the people? LinkedIn. Oh, my God. LinkedIn has so much information. Um, if you go out to LinkedIn, you'll find out uh, how long somebody has been at the company, the technology that they use at the company. I run this uh, uh, version of SQL Server. Uh, I'm the Apache uh, web server manager, wh whatever. People like to talk about what they've done. If you've spent time working in IT and you want credit for your work, you're going to go to your LinkedIn profile and not only tell the people who are looking today, but tell the recruiters who are going to be looking for you soon enough um, what tech you have. Hunter.io is a good site for pulling up email addresses. Pastebin is a good site for pulling up uh, addresses that have already been or uh, accounts that have already been compromised that people don't know it yet. Right. Somebody uh, gets a, a credential database, right? A, a set of usernames, passwords. They'll take a tiny subset and maybe paste that out to Pastebin and say, look, I really have the goods. If you send uh, so much Bitcoin uh, to uh, to this wallet, then I'll give you the whole password. dump." Um, I was on a pen test for a company outside of Ohio, and I found that somebody had used their work email to sign up for a non-work site. And that email and password combination had been compromised and published to Pastebin. Now, it was a hash of the password, right? So I couldn't see it plain text. But I used, was I think I did Red Noise, right? One of these MD5 search engines that takes a pattern and does a reverse lookup. And it pulled back a six-character alpha string. It was just uh, this woman, her son's name, through a little bit of open source intelligence gathering. She used her son's name. Now, I, I knew it wasn't a, a company company. Uh, account that had been popped because there's no way this company had any systems that allowed for uh, non-complex passwords. But as a, a pen tester, I, I thought, well, okay, I know that she's used her son's name on this website. If I'm planning attacks against her, her credentials on the company website, maybe I'm just going to take some variations of that. I'm going to capitalize the first letter of her son's name. I might add a couple of other characters. I'll do some OSINT gathering to find out what year her son was born and then start doing uh, variations of like the last two years to get me to the eight character complex. So Pastebin will pull up some good info. info. Um, Intel Techniques is one of the most robust sources of uh, OSINT information. They've got a lot of tools for scraping social media profiles. Uh, he's also um, got a tool, uh, Buscador, which is a uh, virtual machine. Um, that's built entirely around OSINT gathering. So it's like if Cali was only doing OSINT, that's what Buscador is intended to be. It's really whittled down. Uh, and then these two tools, hand in hand, Recon NG from uh, Tim Tones and Discover from Lee Baird. Um, if you take time to fine tune Recon G, Recon NG, so you've got all the API keys installed and then you uh, drop Discover on the box, and let it take advantage of Recon NG and some of the other things it does. All you have to do is plug in a domain name and it's going to gather pages and pages of OSINT for you. So do all this other stuff first so you understand context, you understand how the tools work and what you're looking for, but run these two, do it against your own company, right? You're not gonna be hitting any of their boxes. This is all information in the public space. You don't even have to ask permission. Public is public. Um, but run those, drop those on uh, Cali. I think Recon's already there. I don't know if they've got Discover baked in yet. Um, and see how much information is available that an attacker might use. Narrowing down on uh, identities, I love to grab document metadata. Um, I use FOCA because I tend to pen test from a Windows box with a Cali VM. Uh, but if you want to stay Linux and do Metagoofle, uh, you just you go out, you grab all the documents that are out published on a website, public information, download them, uh, Analyze, what is it? You have to extract the metadata, analyze the metadata. Oh, yeah, you extract and analyze in that. And then like FOCA, for example, is just going to give you a list of all the information it found. And it includes all the usernames uh, that it was able to pull out. So if you use Windows, you use Microsoft Office, the very first time you set it up, what's your name? What are your initials? You don't need that, right? There's There's... I, say, I don't think you need that. There's not a lot of value, business value. A lot of people do that, forget about it, never see it again. But now your name is inside every document you've created. If I'm an attacker and I see a name keep popping up again and again here, I'm going to know that that person somehow has authority at the company to publish information on their website. I'm also likely going to get their username. 
So if I can target that person when I'm, I'm going in, go after their credentials, I might not only be able to steal stuff from the company internally, but I can introduce something to his or her machine that can compromise the stuff that they're publishing out to the website so I could hit all the customers in addition to the employees. So what are we looking for? We want to know the technology stack so we can get admin guides. I did a pen test once, uh, and to, uh, again, to Bill's point about how uh, OWASP isn't just SQL injection, now it's just injection. Uh, I found a company that had an admin web interface for a PBX system published, small company. Uh, this web app was older than God, uh, so I had a, a hunch I was going to be able to find something exploitable there. But I went the easy route. I pulled down the admin guide, looked up the admin username and password, threw that into the login page, and it let me write in. So whoever deployed it, uh, security misconfiguration, hadn't changed the default credentials for the admin account. Once I got in, uh, I poked around the app to see what functionality it had. And I found that there were some network utilities that would like go to the, the server and, and run NetStat. And uh, a couple of others that told me what operating system I was looking at at the back end. But then I thought, I wonder what happens if I fire up a, a web proxy and just watch that traffic. And it was it was just sending these commands directly. So what did I do? Some of you know, I, t I can feel it. I, I told my proxy, oh, that netstack command, don't send that. Send cat Etsy password. And then when it returned the values to my browser, it gave me the contents of the Etsy password file. So now I knew I had the authority to run commands on the box with whatever permission the uh, application server, web server was running under. So admin guides are a fantastic resource when it comes to, especially if I hadn't been able to log in, if I hadn't been able to compromise that administrative account, I couldn't have, have compromised the internal network. Um, new hire and uh, how-to guides, right? If you have users who are on uh, VPN as part of their job, somebody has likely published, published a, here's how to use VPN. Uh, if you got any new hire documentation, right? Here are all the websites you need to log into to do your job. Here's the default password we've assigned to your account. I have found all of these in pen test. So out of that document, uh, don't just focus on the metadata, but you will find some context there. Um, you are going to find the user naming convention, right? I'm jared.brennan in uh, email. Um, so through hunter.io, through the document metadata, you're going to get a feel for whether or not it's first.last, first underscore last, first initial last, or some random employee ID uh, variable that's going to be harder for me to pop. And you're going to identify all the login portals, webmail, SSL VPN, and password self-service are my favorite. Um, password spraying, who's done this? Right, if you've not done this, uh, get permission and do it because it's fantastic. Um, it's the inverse of uh, brute force attack. So if I want credentials and I find that somebody has some Microsoft tech on the, the internet, um, instead of saying, oh, I found this username in my discover scan, uh, send all these passwords against that portal with this one username. I'm not going to do that anymore because any uh, app or system administrator worth his or her salt has configured that to lock out after X number of attempts and notify somebody when that activity happens. So Black Hills has uh, um, their write up, I have a link to it from earlier, uh, was let's take one password uh, and throw it against every user account because any admin who has configured an application to lock somebody out after one failed login has already been fired. Um, so you're going to throw these passwords against every account one at a time in a way that doesn't trip any of the defensive controls. If anybody is using summer 2018 exclamation point as your password, don't tell anybody in this room. That would be terribly embarrassing. Um, why is that such an effective password? Sorry. <laughs> why is that such an effective password, though, for end users? Yeah, it rotates every 90 days. And does it meet all of the password complexity requirements that every standard tells us we have to follow? Upper, lower, number, special character. Um, if you go to any particular geographic region, I'm out of Columbus. So I tend to go with anything Bucks, Brutus. Uh, I'll find somebody who's using some variation of that password. Up here, it's going to be tribe, calves, right? So depending on where you're testing, if you start to take information either about local sports teams or about the company, you can start to build out a custom password list. And over a couple of days, 
you will find people. One of, one of the tests I was on, a guy got in um, doing this smaller company and was able to pop three accounts uh, with just a couple of passwords, which fascinates me because this company I thought was doing a better job than that. Um, I've got Burp in here just as a side note. Um, while you're using a tool like NTL and Bother uh, to go against, um, what is it, uh, the, like the auto discover service, um, Burp can go against any web interface with a little fine tuning. You can do that same conceptual password attack of uh, one password against every user account against any web application uh, login page. And then once you're in, your goal is to score some creds, forge tickets. So tools like Mimikatz, Kerberos, the PowerShell Empire Toolkit uh, are all incredibly effective and have robust documentation. If you've not used any of these tools, uh, go to YouTube. How to use Mimikatz, right? How to use uh, Kerberos. And it's going to give you an idea of how you can pull creds from whatever box you're on or, or internally. Um, the uh, power-up tool. Um, I've only seen this used once. This is one of those tools that I wish I had more, uh, more screen time with. Um, but with Power Up, you can look at services, if I've got this right, services that are running locally with escalated privileges and see if you can get into that service, right? Like trip that service, have it restart and add a little bit of your own uh, commands to that, that command line execution, right? If I've got an account or uh, like um, uh, endpoint protection, right? An antivirus solution that's for some reason running at uh, the highest level of privileges on the box. If I can trip that up and say, go ahead and create a local admin account and bounce that service, then when it starts back up, it's going to do what it was designed to do, and it's also going to do this other thing for me. Um, so with those four tools, you're able to get in um, and do some cool, sexy stuff on the tech side, but social engineering is where it's at. Um, the hardest job I had as a pen tester wasn't the actual test itself. It was convincing the client to let us do social engineering. Oh, we know you're going to get in that way. Don't test it. That's not the freaking point. You want to help people see how bad it is and understand it and know um, what kind of attacks people will really use so they can prepare their own defenses and build it into their awareness training. This tweet, I, I include this here because it's from June 4th, 2016. And it's talking about tricking people who have Google Authenticator tied to uh, multi-factor app access, which I use uh, multi-factor on like all my social media, all my email. Um, and he was saying that, you know, you'll get a, a message, somebody, um, and I've heard Dave Kennedy talk about the same attack. Um, you, uh, you try to log in, you get in successfully with a set of creds, and then it sends a command to the two-factor. Just keep doing it. If you get a user who just wants that stupid pop-up to go away, eventually they'll click yes, right? You're trusting that the users understand why we do two-factor. That's not always the case. Text me a recovery code. I'm trying to get into my uh, my thing. You've got my phone number. I love that one. As somebody who's changed jobs a few times, um, that's a legitimate concern for me. Uh, anybody recognize this guy? He is a uh, medical professional uh, who uh, worked for uh, one of the most powerful people in the world. Um, this This is seriously his current Facebook profile picture. And this is a sticky note on his monitor. Now, I have not been able to make out what exactly is on that sticky note, um, but I have a hunch I know what it is. And it's a common problem that we still have. If you can get physical access to an organization, right? Hey, I'm, I'm here from so-and-so to inspect the building for radon. I'm expecting the, the smoke detectors. I've got to check the fire extinguishers. Make up your story, get in the front door, and walk around and write down every set of credentials you see on a sticky note and a whiteboard. That is a great way to get valid credentials uh, that you're able to use then once you leave and go back out. Um, phone calls. Hi, this is uh, Jared from ABC Integrators. Uh, your company engaged us to build uh, a login page for that app that you log in to do your job. And your manager gave me your name as somebody to be in the pilot group. If you could give me your username and password, I'll go ahead and get you set up in that system. And then when they're ready to test, they'll reach out to you. Run that call by as many people in the company as you can get away with and see how many people just voluntarily say, oh, yeah, of course. Boy, that'll be easier. Now I won't have to remember two of those passwords to do my job. Uh, I'd love to. Here's, here's my password. Um, and then uh, password uh, reset notifications. 
If you've ever played out around with the Social Engineer Toolkit, you've seen the Site Cloner functionality, right? I'm going to stand up whatever web page I'm going after, and then I'm just going to send a message, phishing email to the people to say, uh, hey, we've had some suspicious activity on your account. Please go to this web page and log in to make sure your account's still good. I don't even have to tell them to change their password. I'm just telling them, look, I'm watching out for you. When they follow my malicious link, it looks exactly like the web page that they're expecting. They type in their credentials. It gets written to a log file on the attack box, and now I've got a valid set of creds. If I want to get super sexy, I redirect them to the actual website, log in form behind the screens. They see, oh, yeah, everything's cool. They close the window, and they forget about it. And then I can play with those creds for as long as their, um, their password's valid. I've actually got into an organization by resetting somebody's password using the password self-service portal. Pro tip, stop answering the damn social media quizzes about what's my wedding name, what's my porn name, what is your porn name? Does anybody know the formula for your porn name? Yeah, yeah, it's the the name of your first pet and the street you grew up on, which I won't tell you my porn name because it's it's um, it works. Yeah, no, I'm not going to say it. I'm just saying it would be a good porn name, but uh, it would also give you two of the answers to secret questions that every website asks uh, you to provide. Um, the, the wedding one during the royal wedding, the quiz that was going around had even better. What, what was that one? There was like your maternal grandmother's maiden name or something. It got really specific. But if you have any social media profiles that you can find that belong to people who work at the company you're, you're targeting, and they haven't put the right privacy controls to keep you from seeing all their information, just go through and look for all their answers to those quizzes. You'll have enough information to fill out their password reset form. Now, this is where it's tricky. What, what I ran into, I had a company that we did a pen test for them one year. I found their password reset portal, and they had a setup that you got two chances, and then it would lock the user out of that portal. If they could not remember their secret questions after two chances, uh, they had to call the help desk and talk to somebody. That was pretty good. Um, but if you went in and got, they had to answer like 10 questions uh, in order to be registered with the system. If I went to their their reset page, which I was able to get all their usernames from uh, so, uh, OSIT gathering, um, then it would only give you two questions. Well, you just go back and then you go into that page again and it'll give you different questions. And it doesn't trigger that account lockout. So what I would do is I would find somebody I would have wanted to attack I would enumerate all their secret questions, and then I would go to my life, although Family Tree now is even worse. Here's a pro tip. Look yourself up on these two websites. I looked my wife up on one of these websites. I've known my wife, God, 30 years. We, we have known each other for the majority of our lives, and I was seeing names on this website that I never heard of. And it's not like we don't keep secrets from each other. It's just not how our relationship works. Um, but I, I'm sitting on my laptop on one end of the couch, and I'm like, Who's so and so? She looked at me. She said, "How do you know that name?" She's like, "I haven't thought about that person in years." That was our our neighbor when I was a kid living on this street. She would come over and babysit us every once in a while. And she's like, "How the hell do you know that name?" I'm like, "No, nah, never mind. I'm just working." Um, <laughs> but um, if you go out there, you can find the information you're looking for uh, for some of the questions, like what year did uh, you graduate high school? Right? You're going to know when they were born. You can do the math as long as they were. Uh, Successful student, which most people who end up in professional uh, sis, uh, uh, positions usually at least have a GED, right? Um, I had this uh, one organization that uh, the one guy I wanted to pop had uh, Giants jerseys on in every picture. Every picture I found of this guy online. And one of his secret questions, what's your favorite sports team? I'm like, either he is a master troll or this is the right answer. And unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to get him, which... Giants was tricky because it could be Giants, it could be NY Giants, it could be New York Giants. There are three different strings. I only had two chances. I missed it. I had another guy that uh, one of the questions I was able to get is, uh, what year did you graduate from high school? Uh, my life gave me enough info to put that one together. The other one was, what was your favorite toy as a child? So I don't know if you even know the answer to that question. What was your favorite toy as a child? Could you like? I look back, I'm like, well, you know, I... Hey, G.I. Joe, but I wasn't really into it, but I kind of like collecting. My brother was real big into the little WWF wrestlers, the, the big rubber ones. Those were awesome. Um, but that was his thing, not mine. Um, and I'm thinking, there's no way in hell I'm going to get this answer. But I poke around, a little OSINT gathering about that guy, and he was in IT. He had his own website. I go to his website, and the favorite icon is a Lego head. 
And I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. This guy's a Lego junkie. So I go back to the password reset portal, uh, favorite toy, L-E-G-O-S, enter, what do you want your new password to be? Now with this one, um, I the clock was ticking as soon as I entered the new password because we were only allowed to test during the work day, uh, Monday through Friday. So I knew if I'm going to pop somebody, they're going to call the help desk as soon as their phone says you can't log into your email anymore. So I already had all the web pages I'd found through OSINT gathering dialed up. And as soon as I reset the password, I logged into VPN, which was single factor. I logged into the webmail and pulled down some information, just enough to do proof of concept to the customer. Um, and then I had to call the customer and say, look, you're going to have a really pissed off IT director calling you in about five minutes. Um, sorry, you knew this was happening because I told them the previous year to fix this and they hadn't. So I let the guy know this year I'm going to pop it. That's where I'm starting. Um, so uh, password self-service is great. User self-registration is even better. If I'm going after a web application vulnerability and everything is protected with a login page, I can't do anything. But as soon as I get past that login page, I can see everything in the app that a regular user is going to see. If I can self-register within a web application uh, as a, a customer, then I can do uh, a lot of recon and potentially some damage. Uh, case in point, uh, I had a shop I was working with. We did some consulting to help them do security, and they were smart. The people I worked with there knew what they were doing, and they did the right thing almost all the time. Um, they gave us a web app that was customer-facing and said, we want to see if you can uh, test this, tell us if, if we have any significant weaknesses we have to address. Um, and it was built on Drupal. Now, and I'm not talking like Drupal again, and I wasn't taking advantage of that. I started toying around in the app, watching through the web proxy, and I found that in the URL, Instead of having like a, a user identifier, they had um, a number that was actually like a, a database reference, right? Like record number 345 was this person. And so when I was doing everything with mine, I, I saw that the same number kept popping up. So I just um, decremented, is that how I say it? I went down one and I got somebody else's information. And some of the information in there was resetting your password. And I thought, oh, this is great. So I kept going down and down and down until I went to zero. Anybody know Drupal? That's the super admin. Drupal has an account that is admin over all the admins. And it's that identifier number zero. And I thought, I'm resetting that password and owning everything. So I threw a password reset command at it, and it said, nope, we're not going to be stupid enough to let you reset the password for this account. So I just started going back up, right? They had a control in to keep me from resetting the super master password. But I went one, no account, two, no account, three, I got somebody. Now, who do you think is going to be the first account they created after the super admin? It's going to be the, the developer who is responsible for managing, deploying, administering this account. So I popped their account and I had the same privileges I would have had as that Drupal admin, save one or two. But I had administrative credentials through an application weakness because I was able to self-register on a website. And then, um, interest of time, I won't go into Responder too much. The one takeaway here, if you've not run Responder on your own internal network, do it. Oh, my God, it's great. Um, the, the short version, uh, your box is going to be intercepting all these credentials and then just popping them up on screen. That's like the super short version. Check out Responder because it shows you that once an attacker gets on the internal network and they just start listening for traffic, there are tools that we have available they're going to give us even more credentials so we can start uh, rolling around. And it only takes one set of creds. You can use all these tools, techniques. You just have to pop one. Because you pop one, and then you're, you're uh, moving laterally in the organization. You're looking for ways to escalate locally and to get into uh, other systems. And ultimately, that leads you to owning the entire network. So first thing I recommend you do, analyze your own external attack surface. This is where we flip from the red team to the blue team. If you have not done any of this OSINT gathering against your organization, do it when you get back to work next week. If you're like me and you work on the weekends just for funsies, do it this weekend. Walk in Monday morning and say, hey, why do we have this non-production system sitting on the Internet that anybody can talk to it? Are we protecting that with the same controls we put on our production system? Um, you can do some port scans. This is where you have to ask for permission, right? You don't have to rely on OSINT. Do some actual active intelligence gathering. Uh, and do some sort of vulnerability scan to complement that. Um, the vulnerability scanners I've got listed here are more system level. 
although I know they're starting to bleed into web app. Uh, if you're doing web application vulnerability scans, my recommendation is that you do a, an authenticated scan of a non-production instance of the web app. Don't just point a web app at a URL and not put any creds in and say, we're okay. Um, you're not going to find the things that you need to, uh, to look for. But do your own analysis and then start to take a step-by-step -step approach to shrinking it. You don't want to make it easy for the people who are, you, who, are who are targeting you. And there may be some things you have to leave out there, but take away the low-hanging fruit. That's, a, that's an easy win. That's a gimme. Uh, consolidate or eliminate internet-facing systems or applications. Maybe it's time to finally take that server offline that you stopped using five years ago. Uh, close open network ports. Um, go through the um, tools like Metagoofle and uh, Foca. Uh, see what files are out there and make a decision. Do we need all these files on the internet? Can we sanitize the metadata and publish sanitized versions of the files so attackers can't get that same information? Um, Go through your system and look for people who no longer uh, exist in the HR system and shut down all of their accounts. Easier said than done when we talk about software as a service, right? You're going to have to go to the application. Well, you're going to have to find out what all your SaaS apps are in the first place. Then you're going to have to figure out who the, uh, the business owner or user is. And if you don't have a tie-in back to your central access management system, your central directory, then somebody's going to have to do that manually. They're going to have to go through and say, yep, this person's still here, still here. Quit three years ago. Let's go ahead and turn that off. Still here. Um, remove unnecessary privileges. I don't know if you go through a process today to figure out who has access to what. I can tell you, um, I just posted this on LinkedIn and then Twitter uh, yesterday, too. Uh, CU Spider from, is it Columbia or Cornell? Does anybody know this tool? Right, it's a rock simple little. Uh, it's free, number one, but it's it's a regex pattern matching tool. Um, in my retail days, uh, I took that tool and I threw it at the company all share drive. Right? Do you have a company all share drive? That one cesspool where everything ends up. Um, if you take this tool and run it against that drive, uh, and say, just show me patterns that look like social security numbers and credit card numbers. Uh, you may find, like we found even on a, a pen test within the past year, um, that the HR department uh, is still using the company all share, uh, and they have an HR folder that has uh, socials for every employee in the company. Um, we found that with a user, a set of user credentials that was your traditional end user that had zero business justification for having access to HR data. But uh, it was a problem with how they were managing data and storing it internally. But take a look at what privileges the user accounts have, because if an attacker actually gets in and pops a set of credentials, if you've limited what those creds can do and the attacker tries to go beyond that, then you're going to be able to alert on that activity and detect it pretty quick. Um, Multi-factor is not just a VPN thing anymore. Uh, Multi-factor on apps, at the like on-prem apps and software as a service, Make it a requirement for people who are putting data, like sensitive data, in apps that live outside of your network. I'm okay if you want to use uh, Salesforce or if you want to use DocuSign, uh, but I want to put two-factor in front of it. I don't care what that two-factor is, right? You can make it uh, Google. You can make it Microsoft. You can make it Authy, whatever. There's just got to be a second factor so that somebody else can't get in and get to that data because those software as a service providers aren't watching to see who should be logging in and who shouldn't. Uh, and then security awareness training. Tell people to stop using corporate email for personal sites. Um, Ashley Madison, right? Yeah, everybody's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be too excited about that. I don't want to tip my hand. Um, if, if you're consenting adults and you want to have uh, extramarital affairs, I'm not gonna judge. Not for me, but I'm not gonna judge. Don't use your company email that's first dot last at company dot com to register for sites like that, folks. That's just stupid. That's the opposite of discrete. Uh, and if you go back to the Ashley Madison hack and do some digging, the percentage of corporate email addresses that showed up in that dump is ridiculous. And it's because once people get a corporate email address, they use it for everything. Uh, and if you know that, then you know you can come around like I did at the, the one company. You can find information that's going to help you get in. So teach them to stay away from doing that Tell them not to overshare on social media and teach them how to detect and respond to social engineering attacks. 
do not engage the attacker. Um, I've had organizations that think it's funny when you're pen testing to say, ha ha, I know what you're doing. Uh, good try. Um, and I got one to, um, they gave me too much information as part of that exchange. I can't go into too much detail on that one, but teach them to report social engineering. Give them credit. That's a good thing. If they come to you and say, hey, is this bad? Right. Give them praise or kudos or gift cards or whatever. Um, but if you're just teaching people those three things about protecting their identity, their corporate identity, you're going to reduce the likelihood that an attacker is going to be able to use any of those techniques against you. Um, taking a closer look at your admin privileges, who has them? Do we have two accounts for administrators uh, where they have their user account and their admin account? Um, do we take passwords away from administrators? Do we have a password check-in, check-out process? I've worked at organizations that uh, have master keys, right? Physical keys that can get into every building, every room, everywhere. It's common practice for places that we still use physical keys to have, like uh, janitors or people who need to get into everything. When somebody loses one of those keys or uh, can't come up, like they don't even have an inventory, and you say, well, we've, we've got to go change the locks, right? The answer is, no, we don't. That's expensive. We're just going to trust that nobody knows what that key's for and how to use it. Makes me uncomfortable as a security professional, but it's a real problem to come up with money that wasn't in the budget to address something like that. If you can start to give admins the ability to do their job in a way that doesn't require them having those keys, uh, you don't have to worry about changing them when people leave the company. Um, if you're not using LAPS, uh, local administrator, what is it, password solution, the Microsoft tool, use it. It gives you the ability to get away from having the same username password on every Windows box in your environment. Makes it a lot harder for lateral movement once somebody gets inside. Free solution, relatively simple to deploy. I'm oversimplifying. It takes some effort. Uh, but it has tremendous security value. And tweak your logging and monitoring. Um, log management is your long-term stuff, same as your, your short-term. Start to get an understanding of what normal looks like on your network, especially from an identity standpoint. Uh, and then say, oh, yeah, anytime somebody gets added to the domain admin group, tell me. Uh, anytime somebody tries to authenticate to our web apps from midnight to 6 a.m., tell me. Because unless you're at a global company or unless you're really terrible to your employees and make them work all through the night, uh, there are certain times of the day that people shouldn't have to log in. There's some basic things that you can watch for that are going to tell you when somebody is trying to compromise uh, user accounts. Lenny Zeltzer, who knows the name? Yes. Uh, Lenny Zeltzer and Anton Chubakin, uh, a number of years ago, put together uh, a number of like log ma management and security information event management cheat sheets. If you wanted a short list of what do I need to look for when I'm, I'm talking to my people about tweaking the logging system, hit up their incident uh, log review checklist. Um, it's, it takes the, the perspective of you've had a bad thing happen. You need to go back to the logs and you're looking for this information. If you just add this stuff to your logging and monitoring system, it's that 80 20 rule, right? You are getting so much value for adding just a couple of things and all the stuff out on zelser.com. He's got a ton of cheat sheets out there. It's all free. It's information that's in the public space for you to use. Take that, true up your logging and monitoring system and you're going to know when you have somebody on the network who, uh, who shouldn't be there. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share is uh, don't fear misdirection. Um, fake admin accounts are great, right? Honeypots having a system that looks too good to be true is great. But what if you stand up an administrator account? Did anybody sit in on the active defense talk that Matt did early, right? Same concept at the system level instead of the app level. I have an account that can't do anything, but I want it to look super sexy. I want it to have the word admin in the title. And I'm going to have one alert in my logging system. That says, if this account shows up anywhere, tell me right away. Because the only person who even knows about that account is somebody on your network who shouldn't be there in the first place. Or an employee who thinks they've got a way to commit fraud or do something they're not supposed to do by taking over an account using some tools they just learned about on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of, of tech out there that um, uh, a lot of solutions you can tech into. Um, Honeycreds. And canary tokens go a step beyond just 
the honey pot, the box that has the ports and the services, but the accounts and the, um, like a, somebody actually successfully executes Mimikatz and gets stuff out of memory. You can use, um, I think it's Honeycreds will put the, the fake stuff in there that they can start trying to use. One of the two is. So wrapping it up, and you'll hear this from me again and again and again if, if you talk to me, it's, it's not the super sexy fancy stuff that's going to save us. It's the fundamentals. It's the basics. I'm trying to give you some of the basics, the simple stuff to do here. If you can just focus on some of these on the prevention side, on the detection side, on the, the response side, um, you're going to significantly reduce the likelihood and potential impact of an actual security incident. Um, the resources here at the end, I mentioned I'm out on, um, I've got the slide share link. Um, these are a couple of my other talks, but uh, that's my slide share profile right there. Um, take some time to learn about open source intelligence gathering. Make sure you've got an understanding of what identity and access management looks like to a, a defender. Um, hit up those cheat sheets, play around with some, uh, some tools. AD Security had a good article on how to detect when people are using PowerShell tools. That's a whole nother conversation, but now the PowerShell comes part and parcel with Windows 10. Uh, the number of tools coming out to help us compromise network environments by using PowerShell uh, is fantastic. Does your uh, gym in accounting ever need to use PowerShell? Chances are it probably doesn't. Um, so there's some simple detective controls you can put in there. And then this guy at the end came out of all my consulting days. I put together a security framework that's all about the fundamentals. So it's not the 150, 200 questions you're going to see like FISMA, PCI, ISO. It's just 20 questions that you should be able to sit down and talk to your leadership team about and say, can we say yes to every one of these? And if you can't say yes to everything in that list, then uh, I would encourage you to step back from trying to do the crazy, complicated, blinky light stuff. Take time to get the fundamentals right, and it's going to make a big difference. Um, if you use it or if you've looked at it, I'd love to hear about it because if I'm totally off the mark, call bullshit on me, tell me about it, and give me an idea of how to make it better. I think it's something that can really help out. And I've got three minutes before the next person comes up, so maybe uh, a minute. Any questions? Anything you want to hit me up with? This is me online. Um, I'm online a lot. I'm online too much. I'm not a hard person to find. If you want to hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn, you're more likely to get a response. If you send me an email, I'll get to it. It'll take a while. Email is kind of the last minute. Um, really appreciate your time today. And again, anything you want to talk about later on, just let me know. Thank you.